Hi, I'm Liv and welcome back to The Book Nook. Hey guys, so I did already film this video once but due to technical problems it turned into a shit show so I'm filming it again. Fun times! My hair was a lot less wayward on the last one, but we're just going with it. So this video is the first in a series of four on Norse reading lists, and this one is all about the old Norse texts. Two disclaimers right at the top. First one, I am not an expert. I am a layperson, a hobbyist. I find old Norse, both the language and the myth and the history, endlessly fascinating. Anything to do with old Scandinavia, stuff like that, I just find super, super interesting. For the last couple of years, I've been getting into it more. And as it's Norse November, I thought it's a great time to share that with you. And for anyone who's looking into learning more, this can be a jumping off point. It's a somewhere to start. If you're someone who knows more than me about this stuff, and that is very likely, please do have a chat with me in the comments below. I'm super open to like being wrong and learning more about this stuff because every day is a school day. Disclaimer number two, language. I am really nervous about doing this video, if I'm honest, because it's gonna be using vernacular that is not familiar to me. I'm not gonna be using the Americanized pronunciations of things, even though that would be easier, but all of this stuff is steeped in a real language. So I'm going to be attempting to use pronunciations that are closer to the Old Norse rather than modern or contemporary Icelandic. From what I can gather, there are kind of two schools of thought when it comes to pronouncing a lot of the names in Norse mythology. There are those that go with modern Icelandic pronunciations and those that go with Old Norse. Through my research, I've been watching a lot of professor or doctor, forget which one he is, Jackson Crawford, who does do the pronunciations in Old Norse because he is an Old Norse specialist. But I've also been watching videos by a lovely young lady called Hrathna, who is Icelandic, and lots of her videos are talking about how Americans butcher the pronunciations of things like Thor and Odin, should be Thor and Odin, I think. <laughs> but she comes from a modern contemporary Icelandic pronunciation point of view. So I am going to be trying to hew more closely to Old Norse, but I will inevitably get it wrong because one thing I've learned, first language English speaker, my mouth don't make the shapes that it needs to make. Rolling the R's is not something that comes naturally to me. A lot of the other mouth shapes are not things that come naturally to me. The vowel sounds are weird and unnatural to an English first language speaker. So I'm going to be doing my best. Please bear with me. Please don't laugh. Like, I will probably laugh at myself, but that's fine. I can laugh at me, I think, as long as I'm trying. Even if I get it wrong, correct me, but don't laugh. Be nice. So, those are the two disclaimers out of the way. Not an expert. I'm gonna get the language wrong, but I'm trying my best. So I did, in preparation for this video and other Norse member videos, get myself a Viking horn drinking cup. Now, it looks really cool, but I'm never gonna drink from this because it smells like ass. Like, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, I don't know why I'm surprised. It's a piece of horn. It, it just... Ugh. Somehow it's a surprise every time. Like, you know dog chew toys that are literally bits of horn? It smells like that and you've got to stick your nose in it. No thanks. So that kind of backfired. So instead, I'm going to use my totally historically inaccurate massive tankard. Just channeling my inner Sam Regal with a comically oversized cup. Okay, that's enough waffle and trying to put it off because I'm nervous. Let's do this. So part one in Norse reading list, this is the Old Norse Texts. So when it comes to Old Norse historical sources of myth and legend and beliefs, there are two main sources that are primarily used. They are the Poetic and the Prose Edda. They're two very different volumes, as is baked into the name, Poetic and Prose, with very different histories. So I'm going to talk a bit about each of them. So first up is the Poetic Edda, or the Saimundar Edda, also known as the Elder Edda, because it's older than the other one. Smart. So the Poetic Edda is based on a book written in Iceland in around about 1270 called the Codex Regius, or the King's Book, or in Old Norse Icelandic, Kerning's Book. So that's what the Poetic Edda that we know today is copied from, but there is evidence that the Codex Regius was itself copied from another manuscript, and I find all of this really kind of fascinating. The proof of that is to do with some of the things that have been copied. But there is evidence that the Codex Regius itself was most likely copied from older manuscripts. Probably not even one manuscript, but various older manuscripts. And the reason for that is there are kind of incomplete replacements in the text. Like the best analogy I can think of is if you were copying Shakespeare uh, into a more modern contemporary language, which nobody's ever done before, that's a really good idea, somebody should probably do that. 
you were sat copying all of Shakespeare's works out into a more contemporary language and you were trying to transpose the vowels into use, but you weren't fully paying attention and you didn't change all of them and a few vowels were still present. Same kind of thing is evident in the Codex Regius because it was written in the 1200s where there was more contemporary Icelandic rather than Old Norse. It was kind of transposed into contemporary Icelandic, but there would be a few words still in Old Norse that kind of show, right, the source text was probably in Old Norse and somebody wasn't copying it fully attention-wise. That was not a sentence. And there is also apparently evidence that a lot of the poems that are in the Poetic Edda and in the Codex Regius are even older than the Codex Regius and the manuscripts that it was probably copied from as well. They are even older. Of course they are, because oral telling, oral tradition is older than the hills. A lot of the evidence from that apparently comes from the fact that Old Norse poetry, unlike well, still historical, but more contemporary poetry, doesn't use rhyme. That's not kind of the tradition of the skaldic poetry. It uses alliteration in and between lines. But there are instances where the alliteration doesn't work when it's in Icelandic rather than Old Norse. One example that Jackson Crawford talks about is there's a passage where the, the letter V is the kind of alliterated letter, but there is an instance where they put a prefix on a word to make it have a V in Icelandic, whereas you know in Old Norse it would have been the right letter and the alliteration would have worked. So that's kind of evidence that the poems themselves that are in the Poetic Edda were in the Codex Regius, were older than any manuscripts, they got passed down and as a language evolved it wouldn't work with more contemporary tellings. It's a bit like when you're translating anything to English and that's something that a lot of translators will talk about. The words don't always match up so you kind of have to balance losing the the rhyme scheme or the alliteration scheme in this case versus the kind of veracity of the translation itself. I just think it's super super fascinating the ways you can tell how old this shit is. Essentially though the Poetic Edda is a source of beliefs and myths that were prevalent in Scandinavian culture pre-Christianity. So before the majority of Scandinavia was converted to Christianity around about 1000 AD, all of these stories and myths were a source of belief for a lot of these Scandinavian pagan cultures. One little sidebar that I'm going to put in here with regards Poetic Edda is there is one of the poems that is within the Poetic Edda was most likely a separate manuscript altogether from the Codex Regius and that is the Hervamal. So the Hervamal is contained within the Poetic Edda and it's meant to be uh, sort of the, the, the wisdom of Odin and this one is also published separately by Jackson Crawford as a wondrous Hervamal and it's really really fascinating so definitely check that one out. It's weird, you can tell when I'm really, really nervous about the pronunciations because I stop making like eye contact with the camera. <laughs> so the second of the two main Norse texts is the Prose Edda or the Younger Edda because it's younger than the first one. Now the Prose Edda was written by an Icelandic chieftain called Snorri Sturluson and he was uh, born I think about 1170 and died around 1200, I don't know. Basically, he was writing down all the Old Norse myths that he knew. He was writing in a Christian Iceland, so converted to Christianity, and he was trying to write down all the myths he knew in kind of a cohesive framework. I guess trying to kind of write like an Old Norse Bible. But he found that there is no kind of inherent cohesion in Old Norse myths because they are told by different people from different places, different times, and none of them kind of stick together well. He found that a lot of these stories kind of contradicted themselves. You'd find probably like different clans would have slightly different versions of these stories. So he kind of shoehorned in stuff and kind of made it fit. So whereas the Poetic Edda is more of a recording of Old Norse myths and legends, more verbatim, the Prose Edda is more of a kind of recomposition or re-rendering of these myths, trying to make it kind of, I guess, more palatable for a Christian audience. Writing it more as like, oh look at what these pagans believed, but also trying to fit it within a Christian framework. One of the things I found weirdest when I first read the Prose Edda and that confused the hell out of me was because I was expecting it to just be all Old Norse myths. The very first thing is like, in the beginning was God and he created Adam and Eve, and I was like, hmm, hang on, what now? Where's the gods? Prologue of the Prose Edda is kind of, it seems to me to be Snorri Stellison trying to fit all of these Norse gods in as people into kind of a lineage, a bit like the first chapter of the Bible that's sort of like, oh, so-and-so begat so-and-so and so and forth and blah 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 blah. And it's a bit weird and confusing and it goes all the way through like Troy and all through Greece and Africa and stuff and I was very very confused as to where this was going. So for me when I'm reading it I kind of just skip the prologue because it's not as fun, that's not what you're reading it for anyway. 
you're reading it for all the batshit crazy Norse myths, let's be real. So that's my own chaotic attempt at explaining the two main Norse texts, the Poetic and the Prose Eddas. In terms of buying these texts and reading them yourselves, widely regarded the best editions of the Poetic Edda would be Caroline Larrington's version for Oxford, comes with a very good translation, very good notes. She's also done another book which will come up in another video. And my favourite edition is Professor Dr Jackson Crawford's version of the Poetic Edda. That one's published by Hackett and it's also kind of the first translation that puts the Poetic Edda into a more contemporary and readable English, so they are slightly different but they are both worth reading. In terms of the Prose Edda, you are most likely to only find one version on the shelves and that would be Jesse Biok's version for Penguin, which is a good version, but widely regarded the best version is actually the older one for Penguin, which was edited by Anthony Folks. So those are your two main texts, those are the ones that tell you the story of the Norse creation myth and Yggdrasil and the Well of Mimir and Odin's quest for knowledge. Those are all the cool batshit stories, you'll get to meet Loki, you'll get to meet Thor, all of that, those are where those are. But there are three other Old Norse texts that are worth mentioning that I was going to call supplementary but they're not. They are in terms of if you're doing the reading and you just want kind of like the source text, the OGs, you just want the Eddas, but the other three are the three different types of sagas. So first up we have the Icelandic sagas or the Islendiga saga. Now these are sort of family sagas. They are written around about the 1200s, 1300s, but they are about Scandinavian life in the 8 or 900s. They're prose narratives of like shit that actually happened and they're kind of like the best examples of Icelandic literature of that time. If you're looking to read those, they can be found, or the kind of most well-known and most translated ones can be found in Sagas of the Icelanders, edited by Jane Smiley for Penguin, in this beautiful edition with speckled edges. No, deckled edges. Well done. That's kind of one of the first books that I got about old Scandinavian history that kind of got the thirst going. Then we have the King Sagas, or the Kerninga Saga. Mm, that wasn't good. And the most well-known of those would be the Heimskringla, written by our old friend Snorri Sturluson. And that is a story of Swedish and Norwegian kings composed around about, I think it was around about the 1200s. Then the third type of saga is the legendary or heroic saga, or the Fernalda saga. And those are a blend of kind of myth and history that are kind of your entertainment type sagas. They're like your Marvel movies of then kind of thing. And the most popular of those would be the Völsung saga, or the saga of the Völsungs, which tells the story of Sigrid slaying the dragon and all sorts of other crazy shenanigans. And there is a brilliant translation of that by Jackson Crawford, Professor or Doctor, I promise I will find out which one. And as well as the saga of the Völsungs, there is also the, as Jackson Crawford calls it, medieval fanfic sequel, which was written many years later, as medieval fanfic sequel would suggest, and that is the saga of Ragnar Lothbrok. Now, anybody familiar with that name will probably have watched Vikings, which was on the History Channel and is now on Amazon Prime, and I've started watching and it's quite fun, and we'll talk about that more in another video. Another one I'm going to give an honourable mention to, although it's not a true Old Norse text and it's certainly not like an OG text, would be Beowulf. Now this was from a manuscript that was written around about like the late 800s or 900s and there's all sorts of hoo-ha about who wrote it, how many people wrote it, when it was written, when the first manuscript was, which is the OG manuscript, all of this, but it's the earliest kind of Anglo-Saxon poem and it tells the story of a Norse warrior slaying all sorts of creatures across Sweden and Denmark. So although it is not a true Norse text, it is steeped in Old Norse culture and mythology. It's kind of a very Christianized telling of a Norse hero. So, as I say, not an OG text, but worth an honourable mention. So there you have it. Those are what are widely considered to be like the OG Norse text, the Poetic and the Prose Eddas, and the three types of sagas and honourable mention to Beowulf. Those are your jumping off points if you are actually interested in kind of the source texts of the myths. Now there is nothing wrong with just launching straight into retellings of the myths, which is what another video will be on, but it is definitely worth looking at these original texts and where they come from because all of the retellings of Norse myths kind of fall foul a little bit of the same thing that Snorri Sturluson fell foul of, which is trying to kind of make things cohesive that were from an oral storytelling tradition, so kind of don't always lend themselves to cohesion. But that's for the next video.
So I hope that was useful for you, entertaining, perhaps enlightening, perhaps intriguing, perhaps you're going to go off and buy a copy of the Poetic Edda or the Prose Edda or maybe get some of your sagas on. And I hope my pronunciations weren't too embarrassing. They felt okay in the most part. In terms of what other videos we're going to do for Norse November, we are going to do the other three kind of themed reading list type videos. So we've got the Norse myths, historical nonfiction and fiction. So those will all be coming up. I'm also going to do one or two videos, I haven't quite decided yet, on language and the runes because that's something that I think needs talking about. I'm potentially going to try and do a little video on kind of the creation myth but do it in a slightly different way, my own little special brand of chaos. We shall see if I can pull that together, I don't know. Then we'll also do a video on Vikings and Norse mythology in popular culture because no one's ever done that before. But if I never did anything because somebody's already done it before me then I'd never do anything in my life. Basically, I'm having fun talking about my Norse dudes. I'm also going to add this video and any other Norse Vember videos to a playlist, a Norse Vember playlist, which will also include videos by other people that I have found super, super helpful in learning more about all this stuff. So I hope you're all keeping safe and well, and I will see you next time for another Norse Vember booktube video. Thank you very much and goodbye.